Professor Gerda was honored to receive his honorary doctorate degree for her lifelong research contribution to the mass extinction that killed off over 70% of Earth's life, known as the dinosaur mass extinction 66 million years ago. Professor Gerda Gelder's primary research interest focuses on major catastrophes in Earth history in the broadest sense, including biological effects of catastrophes, such as mass extinction, meteorite impacts, major volcanic eruptions, rapid climate changes, ocean acidification, and oceanic Marxia events. Her research integrates the different branches of geology, like paleontology, biostatigraphy, geochronology, sedimentology, and geochemistry in reconstructing past environmental changes associated with or leading up to mass extinctions and major evolution of the carnivores. Since 2007, Professor Gerta Keller has been giving several talks related to the topic of research, beginning with second volcanism. Besides, Professor Gerta Keller is involved in the outreach activity and the publicity of the research work. In fact, she has given radio talks and TV talks in different parts of the world, in, including BBC documentary on what really killed the dinosaur in the year 2004 itself. This is followed by numerous public lectures to non scientists across the US, and she has advised high school students on science research projects, especially on the KT Moss extinction. Since 1984 till 2019, Professor has supervised graduate students of geology. She has produced several PhDs and has successfully guided 10 postdocs. Most important is the 254 research publications that Professor has produced. And all these research publications, they are in highly reputed and uh, high impact factor journals like Geoscientist. General of Biosciences, Guantana, Sedimentology, etc. Her contributions are many because of time constraints. I have given the achievements of Professor Gerda Teller in a nutshell because it takes really one day for this great achiever. Uh, if I want to tell many things about the uh, science, I take this opportunity to welcome Professor Gerda Teller for this special lecture and I request. My colleague, Professor Kriti Basarajapa, Dean of Science and Technology, University of Mysore, to present the project. This uh, special lecture was arranged because of the efforts of Dr. B.C. and Dr. Reddy. Both of them are retired chief geologist of Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Limited. In fact, Professor uh, Dr. B.C. Jayaprakash, he has given Professor MNV Endowment Lecture in our department a few years back. I welcome you, sir, for this special lecture. In between ONTC and the University of Mysore, Dr. Nagendra, as a Professor Nagendra, has played a major role. He is alumni of our department and the retired professor of Anna University to arrange for this lecture. So I welcome you, Professor Nagendra. So, lecture, we have alumni of our uh, department, uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, retired ONTC geologist here. I welcome you, sir. And more than that, my teacher, Professor K.K. Sharma, is here. He was geophysics professor in our department earlier. He later came out to Chennai. So now, I welcome you. We take this opportunity to welcome all my teaching colleagues, guest faculty, PhD scholars. And the budding scientists, the first and second year MSc Geology and Space Geology students. Mm -hmm. Since this is a live stream lecture, I welcome I welcome all participants throughout the world for this lecture online. Okay. 
Now I have president, Dr. Gerda Keller, to take on the party. Please, Madam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, but here we go in the next step. Thanks. 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 Okay, any sound now? Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to give you a talk. I hope it will be some pleasure here for you too. I I'm still trying to figure out how it's gonna work. Yeah, I want to see this so I can actually talk to you. Okay. Maybe that's better. Okay. Okay. All right, I will. Whenever you don't hear me, just shout, and I will know something will work. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to give you a talk here. And, um, well, the picture is the dinosaurs. And it's not so much that I want to talk about dinosaurs, other than that everybody loves the dinosaurs. And, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. So what I'm talking today is more about an introduction of what science is done to begin with. And secondly, how wrong a lot of things were done. And so I will start first with that introduction. I have a in my pocket. So here we go. So basically, I want to talk about the impact theory. You know what that is. It's uh, 66 million years ago, a mixed meteorite crashed into Jupiter. And in an instant, it caused a mass extinction of the dinosaurs and numerous other organisms, at least 75% of them. Uh, okay. It caused a wildfire as well as global darkness and what is called a nuclear winter. This is the impact theory. The impact theory that ruled the world as the sole cause of the mass extinction and for the fifth mass extinction for that matter. 
and uh, the history and over the next 40 years. This is we tolerated absolutely no other opposition. Um, we eliminated virtually all, all opposition and in the first few years. It is was caused basically by a guy named Louis Alvarez. He was a Nobel Prize winner and his son was a geologist. And uh, together, mostly for, for uh, Louis Alvarez, this became the story and nobody would be allowed to contradict it. From the very beginning, the media loved this story. It was a sexy story and the public loved it. For many science, many scientists jumped on the bandwagon for an easy flight to fame. That's not going to be a good one. Uh, I have to ask who is using this point that I got is supposed to have it does not move. Okay, so, okay, I learned lesson one. What is the point of <clears throat> Basically, the next step is it was the most nasty controversy in your system, especially geologically. It silenced any alternatives, eliminated any opposition. And called it was essentially bullying, name calling, ostracism, and attacks for not being dignity of any scientists. I think we agree with this impact theory. This is the story of the dinosaur wars from the very beginning. It was the most dramatic controversy. And And despite all opposition, it's researched for the truth. In fact, what really caused the dinosaurs? I happen to be in the middle of this mass extinction, in the middle of this controversy. And I did try to find out what caused the actual truth. It was also called the nastiest field in science. It tolerated absolutely no opposition. And it began with the iridium anomaly. The iridium, as you probably know, is supposed to be what was part of the mass extinction. It's known as the same player, and Louis Alvarez, the Nobel Prize winner, believed that this was it. That no second volcanism could have caused any of it. Well, iridium is common in asteroids as well as in the and and it's the concentration is approximately 600 parts per billion. And that's mostly known from mantle plume volcanism as well as 
come by reunion island, etc. Alvarez believed that equilibrium was not valid. The equilibrium was valid because you're not so sure, but but the second world condition was too slow to consider to have high concentrations. So the hypothesis became that a large asteroid in fact caused the dinosaur mass extinction and caught of course killed off about 75% of life on Earth and in a type of nuclear infant wildfire. The question here is how did the impact hypothesis evolve within essentially two years into an unassailable truthiness? We don't know what truthiness is. It simply means it's something that makes the need. <clears throat> so it was unassailable truthiness where the real truth was essentially no fact of factual evidence, and it was dismissed by the common phrases. Everybody believes that the impact caused the mass extinction. And only old fashioned Darwinian paleontologists can't believe that the mass extinction was instantaneous. These are all. These two, as well as the next four, were all the same as um, the Nobel Prize winner, Louis Alvarez. <clears throat> so the next one was paleontologists, uh, really bad scientists, they're just like stamp collectors. And then the last one was that uh, criticism is just. Criticism, very cautious, such as bad scientists or like stamp collectors. I liked all those things, that's why I repeat them. Um, he was wrong in every one of them. And then the last one was actually, I, I quote um, one of my reviewers, anonymous reviewers. Who said it must be true that the impact on the last one? It must be true because how could or how many be so wrong for so long? Uh, he was wrong as well. So, I want to tell you now that most of this is really a story of facts and lives. But most important is the structure of scientific revolutions. It is known from um, basically from, 19, from a 1962 paper uh, by physicists. And another one in 19, 2006 by the trouble with physics by these ones. They're very well known papers and they're fantastic for anyone of you who would learn something about science, whether it is physics, geosciences, or anything for that matter. <coughs> I came across this one in particular um, about 20 years ago. And it was an amazing revelation because I didn't really know how the impactors could be wrong virtually all the time. And yet they could be absolutely devastating for anyone. Well, Beginning of the structure of scientific revolution. 
we begin with the hypothesis, just like we understood. Uh, the hypothesis in this case was that the discovery of an unknown anomaly requires extraordinary explanation. The data that contradict the hypothesis requires modification and dismissal or denial. <clears throat> so this is essentially what we begin with the structure of scientific evolution. So during phase one of the impact hypothesis, scientists lose the perspective in science and give more the impact to the rightness of the impact in the region. Then they progress from fact based to belief based interpretations, meaning two things. On the third part, they start the controversy escalates with heated arguments and accusations and acrimonious attacks. And we've seen this all the way through the last 40, now 42 years. I have. <clears throat> As number four, the new discovery supports alternative hypotheses and requires modifications. We haven't gotten to that yet, but it is just about to happen. So, in the KPD and mass extinction, the controversy follows a common pattern that will be clarified, the clearly defined four phases of the cool and small. In phase one, the hypothesis it is the iridium and the mass extinction. This is what they all mean that. The beginning of the message page. <laughs> now, phase two is the theory. It is the impact and the impact with the iridium and the impact crater that was discovered in the past in the year 2001. In the third part, it's the crisis. This is the crisis, which is the three in impact hypothesis of theory. And in the fourth one, it is the inversions of the decade of the uh, virtue of the new theory or alternative theory. In this case, it was second volumes. So in fact, we now have getting to the end of this. I think you've all seen what the impact looks like. We are talking about the impact here based on essentially the mass extinction. And in this case, the mass extinction was mostly based on tectonic perimeter because <clears throat> because in the first place that was killed off, except for one species uh, during the KP dinosaur war. But all of the other extinctions are also known and very well known. And that starts basically from all the way down to for the next uh, five uh, in time. So, one thing that I, the only one that I think want to remind you is that, in fact, you know, you see another one, I just screw it up. Um, the dinosaur wars. Are uh, the most important one for our 
talk today. But the other one is the Anthropocene, which is because I'm not doing so well here. Anyway, what I want to say is the sixth mass extinction is what is essentially running today. The sixth mass extinction is the one part that we know is already in the middle of the current mass extinction. Um, where the possibility is that we may be we may be extinct before we know it. And most people don't believe it. But it's been a long time. And and, and coming and climate change particularly is very bad. But that's only part of it. So, so let's switch now to the actual part of the science. What I'm showing here is that okay. How can I place this one? What? Using what? Perfect. So, what I want to show you here is the batteries itself. We have up to today about 300 localities. Three hundred localities where we have analyzed the mass extinction, and all the red ones are the most important one, including those with mercury analysis. Uh, in in the first circle, it all has to do. No problems. On to the red one. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so all of these are actually from the impact crater and uh, called Chicxulub. And I've done a lot of work on this for about 15 years until, until it was no longer possible because um, the drug war had taken over. Uh, then the other ones are essentially from loca localities where there are there is no evidence of impact spherules. And then of course there is the uh, <coughs> Deccan volcanism. So all the, all the red ones are the most important localities. The yellow ones usually fail. Uh, we have a hiatus or something like that. Okay. Now, uh, all right. So, what caused the mass extinctions? We know that this is all based on Planktiforamnephora, simply because Planktiforamnephora are the, the only group that died out except for one species. And that species is still around. It simply won't die. It's called Gimbalicria cretacea. But at the time, this year is, let's do it again. This one, these are the large guys, large complex species that died out pretty early. Then we have the smaller black guys that are resistant and died out relatively over a short time period, except for this very tiny one, which is the which is the provider. 
After that, we just have a new evolution of species for the next up down hundred, uh, presumably about 200,000 years or so. I think I'm getting it wrong every time. Here we are. The infant crater. So let's move to the infant crater, which is essentially the Chicxulub, which is in Yucatan. I really have problems. Somebody who's going to put it to me. Yeah, because I am screwing it up every time. Thank you. So I have to go back to this one. So now we have the impact crater. And it's on Chicxulub. This is essentially where the crater was. It was discovered in, in 1990. And at that point, everybody thought, oh, we finally had the impact. So nobody asked what it really was. In fact, I had one person asking me, <clears throat> they had one person that asked, um, asked me to do uh, an analysis of the samples and they gave me one sample and it was 750,000 years old and I asked him what are these affairs supposed to do for me uh, nobody can possibly tell you what age it is in that and he said this is the only sample we have it wasn't the only one it's just they didn't want to let it know so the first thing was he claimed that the impact was the KPD age, but there actually was no evidence for it whatsoever. Second one, he claimed that the impact sparrows were from Mexico. <clears throat> and it was KPD age. But that was not true either. But it predated the mass extinction by as much as a couple of hundred thousand years. The third one was a Yucatan Pemex course. Pemex was the old company course on Yucatan, had burned in a warehouse fire. But that was a lie as well. It never burned in a warehouse fire. And the reason I knew that is because I was asked to give a talk, well, not really a talk. I was asked by NSF to come and give a lecture on this part. And, and the fact was that they didn't have any data for it. So the claim that Phoenix course burned in a warehouse fire was simply a make-believe because if, if they believed it and it was known, which was not known at that time, then they could simply claim that it in fact was correct. So the next thing, so it wasn't burned in a warehouse for a fire. And then it was the claim that the impact it was proved, but it wasn't proved whatsoever. You see, in the first year of this uh, analysis of uh, impactors, they published nine papers in nature, and they were all wrong. There were hardly any that were right. And it was quickly dismissed. So, Next one, we'll go to the impact sales, which were known, and I had 
this my group of students and collaborators, we have worked on for 10 years until the war, the drug war came and nobody could work in Mexico anymore. So what we found, I had, the first one was, I had a, a very um, nice group of students. I, I went on field work uh, every year with my students. And in this case, it was a very smart group and they came and said, look, you, you know, you don't believe in impact. So what we want to do is find whether they have the impact and whether it was right that the age was born. And so I signed them up. It was up on a hill in Mexico, uh, northeastern Mexico. And I told them, okay, here are the picks, the hammers, and everything. Go and start digging. And by the time you get down with digging to the bottom of this hill, if you find, and you have to go at least four feet deep, if you, if you find them at that point, then we may be lucky. Uh, if not, well, you dig further. So after I had two groups, one was the girls, and the girls were not interested in doing the digging. The guys were absolutely crazy about it. And so uh, I alternated between the outcrops with the girls and between the outcrops with the guys. And then they came running and said, we got it, we got it. So we all ran. And it was, and they, they had dug deep enough to find the impact burials, which was two meters thick sequence. And it was absolutely amazing because there was no damage. In other words, it was pure impact stereos. And I will show you that in a minute. But what we really found then was, go back to this. Um, yes. We found that is one of the early parts. We, we dug over about 100 meters. And at the beginning, it was just impact stereos uh, for the first meter part, two meters of it. After that, we petered out and we had uh, all these other localities. So the one in at the middle where you're pointing out, yellow is simply a limestone, and everything else is muddy limestone. The green ones are the impact spirals. And then there is another one we found in later on in a student locality up to eight meters deep. And all of these were pure impact spirals. In other words, we had impact spirals all through the localities. But those were reworked material. You know what rework means. Revert means that they are there and we know they are there, uh, but they've been mixed up in sediments. And so it's not something that you can actually say is real if they are impacts, but it doesn't belong to there. So, next one. So, what we were looking at. He said there were multiple sparrow layers, but the impact itself overall, before we found these impact spheres, were really sediments that were deposited 
in a normal American diet with a lot of sirloin in the soup in Mexico. Then we had multiple stereo layers over the meters of sediments. Okay. The multiple stereo layers over the meters of sediments. And this is one of the pictures my students um, when I lectured them. And they were separated by one stereo layer below, then a sandy limestone, and after that, another stereo layer. <clears throat> In other words, they were all reworked from a previous event. It had nothing to do with that. Um, so we need to go on back. Yes. So what I want to show is what these burials really look like. At the bottom of this sequence, you will see these black glass. This is all pure black impact glass. <clears throat> There's nothing else except an occasional plastic foram that is essentially glass at this point. And then after that, there is a little, and this interval basically at the bottom consists, the dark one, consists of just the impact glass and it is about 20 centimeters thick, nothing else. After that, we get more uh, glass fragments in this middle second part, so we want to just go one down. Yeah, that way. This is just impact glass. Still, there are no impact spherules. And then the next one up, you get more um, sort of, they're not spherules, but they are kind of, they were still hot at the time. And so they are kind of uh, squashed. And after that, we get oval ones. They're the very large ones. Mostly all of these are large ones, uh, up to about five millimeters in size. And after that, they become more round because it's cooling. The uh, impact glass is cooling. And so it's no longer mixed. And after that, it, it just ends. Uh, and marble sediments take over. So when we found this first, it was one hell of a eureka time. Because nobody could believe it. Everyone was just jumping around and taking, digging a lot of impact burials out for their mementos. So, next one. In 2002, we did, we did the impact drilling, which essentially allowed the cost of each And the impactors had, that had managed to drill. Um, the Chicxulub impact, and they found that the impact had predated the mass extinction. But that was not what they thought. Originally, basically, what we had is we had the Nice conference, and We were supposed to give two lectures, the impacts, impactor stage the first lecture, and I gave the second. The first lecture, the impactors decided that everybody has proven yet now that the impact is the Chicxulub impact, this and the mass extinction. 
Uh, nobody ever bothered him about Beck and Wolkenism at that time. And and then the second I came to the second after that I came to the second talk and I said what you heard is exactly the opposite. I will tell you exactly what really happened. Because we had so much data now. And so we came. And uh, before I even got further than the first 10 minutes, uh, everyone was screaming. And uh, eventually, uh, they had to stop and ask that I should be quiet. And we had all the data that we had presented. <coughs> and the reason they thought that we were all right is because they refused to give us any force. And until the very last three weeks before the talk, and I managed to give the talk because, because they didn't have much choice, because Ashma Science had was that this had to be done. So when when we within three weeks we had my team had worked day and night to do all every geochemical analysis, every paleo analogy uh, analysis, absolutely everything. And we had seven different types of evidence. And it was becoming absolutely crazy for the encounters. And so it was a lot of fun, I can tell you. And uh, by the end of the talk, they canceled. They canceled the meeting for the uh, impact traders. And they said that it was all a mistake, that they had actually, that it was not true. So, well, it didn't do it, do them very well because there were thousands of people by then who had heard my talk. And there were thousands of them who believed it, and nobody else did, because we had so much data at that point. So, that's, so basically what you're seeing in, in this particular one, to the bottom where you're pointing at, that's actually the impact crater part at the bottom. Just at the very bottom of it. From then on, from the ratios one centimeter up until to the mass extinction on the next slide. It was essentially uh, glauconite uh, and geochemical data from glauconite all over the place. But none, there was nothing else. There were no impact stereos, none of that. So <clears throat> let's go to the next one. So this is, uh, I can go faster than this one because this is just the data that we analyzed. And uh, again, or you can see we have the COM 29 RH at, at, the, at the very uh, right side. And so on CF1, which is essentially the foreign zone, where the age was correct. And then there was uh, the borough, many of the boroughs, the glauconite, uh, various chemical analysis, carbon isotopes, and uh, the extinction and the evolution. So let's go to the next one. What happened next was that uh, PNAS, uh, which is the most recognized um, 
most recognized uh, journal for uh, published essentially the uh, mass expedition predates the KPE. And it was the most highly cited article. And within the first year, it had 10,000 sightings, no more than that. 10,000 sightings every week. It was unbelievable. So <clears throat> I didn't really like, wow, I think this is an old one. So uh, let's go to the next one. It was very, it was so successful in fact that, that the impactors canceled everything and that they would never talk again about that impact rate until 2000, 2006, 2006, 16, yes. After that, because nobody else was going to redo it and then Germany drilled again. So, so the next part in shaping the face three, we have the crisis, which is essentially telling us that the significant rediscovery underlines the theory and more discoveries follow. Doubts have been raised and the decline. Doubts have been raised uh, and fears will be ended in denial and bullying and misrepresentations and personal attacks. So basically what we had then was that the Chicksworth Crater for uh, predated the mass extinction. And this we know now. Second is that pristine impact failures are much older than the Chicksworth core. It had nothing to do with that. And the third one is the geochemical, mineralogic, and paleontologic data confirm the impact. So, so phase three then turned into the mass extinction crisis. And unveiled. Phase three, phase three was the impact theory's major crisis. It unveiled the science, our scientific results and reverberated through each of you and the conference itself. Um, it's all the impact persistence because of the erroneous thing. And the mass extinction was essentially irreparable uh, for this group. So it was a total loss for the impactors at that point. But they re recovered fairly fast. So, next one. Next one, we wanted to go to the importance, uh, which which was the catastrophe that I still have not found out what really caused it. <clears throat> it was Vincent Cotillo, a geophysicist from Paris who worked for many years on deck and volcanism with his team. And frequently, I knew, I knew him well many, many years. And he frequently would ask me, Gerda, when are you coming to the contracts to tell us where the mass extinction is? And I would tell them, well, like in a joke, whenever I find, whenever I find, uh, in fact, very, not in fact, whenever I find the uh, deck and volcanism, I'll be there. So one day he was screaming through the loudspeaker and telling me, I found it. You have to come now. 
and that was 2007. And uh, so I didn't go, I couldn't go to um, uh, to look at the to look at that point because I had to teach. And so one of my collaborators, Eri Abad, uh, went there to his courtiers with, and they found some special movie samples in fact. And uh, so after that, yes, we found the message <laughs> in Russian movie for that matter. And it was very successful. And from then on, many of the um, in fact, non factors that is, uh, were basically talking about second organism and how long it all was. But it still continued. So, next slide. What I did after 2007 is essentially form a new team. And talk and uh, go about the impact, non impact, I should say, learn about deck and volcanism. And mostly in Russia, Mumbai, but after that, we went all over wherever we could find it. And what I'm showing here are essentially the early two. And the most important ones are these two guys and the one lower left hand. And that is as Chaitrakash and Reni. Um, they were the most amazing people that worked absolutely all the time and helped me do so much of the work I could never have done without them. So, apart from them, I um, there were a couple of others. Well, this the, the lower ones were just two of my women students. One of them is now Chandi Punekash, who was from India and is from India. That's uh, the others are mostly mine. Oh, and then there is one more um, that Syed Kabri, who worked for many years. Uh, with us on on uh, geochemistry and volcanism. Next slide. So our first work then was from Russia Mundri. There are many cores from Madma Russia Mundri and many people have worked on them. Um, particularly also um, Yes, these are the actual forests. If you go all the way down to the uh, Russian area, there are also all these parts that, we, that I managed to actually win with, uh, with ONGC. Next slide. So, by 2009, I had a very good database working in India, mostly on, on, from the drilling. Uh, it was a very unlikely situation at the time because I wanted to learn about OHEC's drilling and whether I could actually get some samples. And as a, I asked first my academic colleagues, and they told me, forget it, you will never get any. And uh, nobody will ever give you any samples. ONGC is very secretive. So I asked, Others and I said, "Tell me what I have to do to learn how I deal with um, the politics, especially when it comes to OHC. 
and uh, I had a number of some help, and uh, they did. So I learned my lessons, and the first thing I did is invited the director at the time to give me a that I would uh, give a talk about the Deccan and the impact, uh, the uh, the impact, and everything else. And so they invited me, and uh, I talked. We talked a lot about it, and before the meeting was over, they actually told me they would invite me, and I could do any any analysis I wanted to do. And uh, at that point, I had invited them to join with my colleagues, Chad Prakash and Reddy, whom I knew from 10 years earlier. I didn't know them personally, but you act, they actually had written a paper that I reviewed, and I thought it was a very promising paper. And so they continued, I gave them some clues to it, and I that paper, I still have it of all things. And after that, I had invited the director of ONGC, I said, whatever you want to do, I have to work with those, with JP and them. And without them, I did not know where to go because I could not find anybody else that would know what I was doing. And so it worked. Um, the uh, director invited me except that not everybody wanted to be invited. So we can end that one. It was absolutely a fantastic work that we did with ONGC. And it continued uh, for several years until basically I had moved on to some other science project. Next one. So, this is basically what we, we look at is the ONGC mega flows that were run. You can see the, the lines that are straight down before the lava flows circle. Uh, essentially, quickly ended the mass, uh, ended the mass extinction. There were a few species still there, but it's not known whether they were still alive or not. And everything else was very fast and it basically ended. So above it in the light purple, it was hiatuses, etc. But there were there was no mass extinction, it was already past. So next one. We worked on some other ones like uh, Megalia, which has the best locality. But unfortunately, it no longer exists because some road was built. Um, the next one. Um, now we get to Deccan volcanism again. And in this case, <coughs> I, I wanted to find Circon dating, some way of dating, but I never had found anybody that knew about how the dating itself, because nobody could find circons and nobody knew much about um, detailed dating from Arkan Argon, which is not very high resolution because it takes a minimum of 200,000 years ever far. So, what we did 
I read a lot about, about a lot of the uh, Turkon dating, and I went to I went to uh, at one time. I went to my uh, collaborator, who was one week one uh, floor down from me. It's a young guy. And I asked him, his name is Blair Shen. And I asked him, I have some news for you. I can, I can pay you circa on age dating. I can pay you, I have enough funds to take you to India with two students. And we will look for dates. Particularly, I want to look at the red balls because the red balls, well, nothing seemed to exist in the red balls at that point. And I said, but the only <laughs> dating I think that will exist will actually be in the red balls. So it was, it was essentially a looking into something that I didn't know exist at all. But I believe it had to exist because there was nothing else. So he said, I don't believe it. There is no way you can have circumstances. And I said, okay, I pay for it and you will see. So about Two months later, we were on our way. He was very happy with his students. And we went there. And the first three weeks, all they did was looking for actual volcanic rocks to date. They found one, but nothing else. And they had, they looked like they were in one hell of a bad mood. And they were telling me, this is all a waste. What are we doing? Why don't we just go and have a vacation? And after a while, we there, they were sitting essentially around one of these tables and not doing anything and just drinking Coca Cola and having a bad day time. And I said, okay, it's enough of you now. I offered to pay you. I didn't offer you a vacation. So, I, you have not done one stitch of work to look at the red balls. So now you better go and do some work. So one of the grad students, finally, they were all so quiet. And he said, well, Kara may be right. Why don't we go and look for bed balls? And so here they went. And from then on, we had lots of bed balls. And within, within the end uh, of about a week, we not only had the red balls, we also found our first eggs uh, on circons. And at that point, everybody was more than happy. And so it worked. Next. <clears throat> this is the team. So we had the three on the left side. Uh, the middle one is Bresden, who is still, in fact, we just finished some work, field work after I came, before I came here. And uh, so we have these three. And then there is Syed Kadri, who's worked with us for, I guess, about 15 years now. Uh, and uh, mostly is working, doing our, leading our field trips. And uh, he does a lot, of, he knows an awful lot about the technologies. And then uh, the, the little guy there is Kiri Nadat, one of my 
both collaborators. And then, of course, there's me. So we did very well. Next slide. So this, this is just science about Deccan traps. And more or less, you see all the red lines is where we found red poles. That doesn't mean that you found very many red poles, but we found a total of 150. And we have and all the red lines that you see have been dated. And it's fantastic that that's and they're still going on. So we are not, not uh, there is still a lot that can be done, but people are really know the part. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know red balls, these are the red guys. Uh, next one. So when you go uranium lead dating, it's uh, very high resolution. Except occasional samples that have a lot of uh, they are things, but sometimes you have uh, some errors in there. But overall, this is all after the mass extinction. This is the mass extinction, and at the bottom, yes, and at the bottom, uh, at the very bottom is the mass extinction there, say. And then if you go down to these thick ones, that just means that we don't have many dates yet. Um, and that is a larger error bar. So this was actually what we did, I think it was 2014. Next one. Now after this paper was done, the last one, not this one, um, Blair and I had to wait. Uh, science was supposed to be published, like they did the, the one the year before, because it was so kind of highly prolific. And then uh, science held up. The paper for seven months. And what they did is essentially called up the Berkeley group to do argon argon dating, which they didn't know yet. But science had been held back for all these months so that they could write a paper then and claim that our work was wrong. And they were right. And that's basically what it ended up. So my, my colleague was absolutely devastated at that point because he tried so hard. And he was a much younger colleague than the Berkeley guy, of course. And uh, I told him then, you're going to be screwed. And yes, he was screwed. So he went and Published, he looked at the paper and published um, all the data that they did not show at that time. And you can see it's all the data for, for the Berkeley group in light blue and with a very fat sausage going all the way down. The fat sausage simply means that there is so much uncertainty. That in fact, all that uncertainty, you have absolutely no age control of that. And, but he had another thing that I thought was really interesting. And that is this yellow part, no yellow, the blue, light blue part. <clears throat> they showed that the argon, argon age was at his age, namely just below the Polat pool. And that that, they thought, was essentially what the impact was. I know you're shaking your head, but actually they were right. 
for reasons that I knew, but they didn't know. And that is, the reason here is that it was the impact spherules that we had discovered, and yet they didn't know that. So, so for them, this was actually the impact uh, and the KT mass extinction right now here. But the actual mass extinction was up here with that lady. So, next one. <coughs> At this point, I wanted to switch some of the science because I wanted, they had just learned that from Beckon volcanism, you get subconvates, not subconvates, you get the age control from Mercury. And that was done actually by a guy named Steve Graspi and his collaborators. And they did essentially the silicon work, which silicon essentially are blown around the world. You don't really get much silicons from the Deccan traps itself, really. But most of it, all the volcanic stuff, gets blown around the world for about a year and a half. And after that, they fall out and rain out. And that's where then you can actually get all the age things. So we see that here. <coughs> so I bought my mercury analyzer and decided, okay, I got my some undergrad students to work on it. And uh, it was actually quite easy. And we analyzed them in, uh, in much higher resolution than anyone else ever had by using the data that actually I could do within um, one centimeter, two centimeters. That's amazing. So, with this data, mercury data, we were set for some new. So, let's go to the next slide. So, what we did then, you needed to do the mercury, you need to extract the mercury data by essentially measuring what had fallen out. And so, this part is all the mercury data, but only the high, the highest accounts. Let me see if I can do this better. So only the highest accounts would be the ones that we considered important. So what you're seeing is there's a very high one here. There are there's a high one here, but it's only one point, but it's still real. And then there are two points and then there's a cool event and there is one but after this all hell broke loose there are 12 mercury points of higher resolution right in here and it goes <coughs> over several thousand so we had this data and we had analyzed it for mercury at, at the section in LSC, Sudicia, and added some others for Israel, Egypt, and various others. But I didn't analyze the Mexico ones. And the reason I didn't analyze the Mexico ones is because if I had analyzed the Mexico ones before I had all the mercury data for other localities, the impactors would kill me because they would not believe anything. So I waited for a year, year and a half, and then 
events to measure the mercury matter based on Mexico. And I have many, many sections in Mexico. So let's go to the next one. Okay. So this is just an, an additional data set with all the mercury data. And of course, the mass extinction itself, along with that one guy that is essentially the Kimberlytria um, cretacea, which is the only species that's alive. <coughs> the impact uh, is the data here is really on the age table, age table, but also the uh, uh, the mass the climate change. So in, in every case there, we have more or less the same group, except nothing hit the cool event here. And after that, we only had, we only had the, the highest value. In other words, most of these sections that we knew of from this Tunisian section were complete, more complete than anyone else. <coughs> so we did very well. So let's go to the next one. <coughs> so I added all the other sections now from Mexico, and I found that in this sequence, is I can reproduce exactly the same as in Mexico. So that was a very high probability that just like before on the previous paper, which was in 2001, 2000, 2001, 21. No, wrong, that's two years ago. <clears throat> but here we saw found now exactly the, exactly the same peaks. So let's go to the next one. Uh, more peaks. This is the hypothermal. Um, this is the carbon 13. There's the oxygen isotope data. And then we are back in. The Mexico, uh, in Mexico is the mercury data. Let's go to the next one. You can do it almost anywhere. Very high peaks, the mass extinction, and uh, nothing else. The next one. So, so we come to the end of this. I showed you to begin with that we had the primary jigsaw impact. <clears throat> now I can really show you. Uh, so we have the impact stereo now. Yes, the impact stereo, which is essentially in green, they're all the pure impact stereos without any other material. And Above it, there is another four meters, and then above it, two meters of mixed reworked spherules separated by limestone. And then we still, there is nothing there, and then we have more or less the impact, the, uh, the, the tip impact and mass extinction right at the top there. So what that means is not only do we have the impact stereo, we have not impact stereo, the mercury tears in the two very high peaks. And uh, I have known in this particular section here that we have all the other data. And then we have these, uh, these peaks here mean absolutely nothing simply because 
This is all literally and the impact barriers were falling out within something like um, a couple of years at most. And so this is just what falls out and forget about that. But there is this giant peak. Yeah, that's the biggest one. It's what we call PE6. PE6 is, is simply the, high, the highest resolution. And it, it's below at about 225,000 uh, years. And then after that, of course, we have virtually nothing again. So, <clears throat> what we what it proved basically is that the Chicxulub impact had nothing to do with the mass extinction. With the mass extinction, it simply was predated a long time before. And this is something I knew a long time, but I couldn't really talk about it because the impact would simply silence it, period. It was not possible. So I finished that work um, a few months ago. Uh, and uh, this, and I'm dying to see, to get to each of you and show what it really, what really happened. And I think a lot of people will be in uproar, unhappy, and some will be happy. So, the next one. So I'm coming back to the structure of uh, scientific revolutions. We are now in phase four. And phase four is essentially the emergence of an alternative hypothesis that better accounts for the observed anomalies. And scientists flock to this study as alternative methods. <coughs> And the alternative methods to modify or for the to modify the theory and its contents. And basically, what we now are looking at is that with all the data that I have showed you, we are now in phase four, and that means second volcanism. Second volcanism is the new theory. Uh, why uh, you have, uh, I would call it, you can call it hypothesis, but it's long past the hypothesis. And it's an ad hoc, in, in the past, it's been an ad hoc modification of the theory. And, uh, and what it is becoming now essentially will be the fall of the impact theory at all. And although I would say it's probably premature simply because the impactors are never going to stop. On the other hand, I also know from my, what I've heard in the last couple of few weeks, anyway, is that uh, chicks, the impact, chicks are looking back, many, many Indians believe as the impact rather than second impacts. And that's kind of surprising to me. But that is actually going to be some big meeting uh, in October and back in London. And I'm about to go on a tenter simply because they all believe that it is the 
in time. So, um, last one. It's just my baby for a This is actually one that I have produced um, illustration wise with some artists. And that was many years ago. And I have worked on that. And it's been reproduced on the big time. So thank you for uh, uh, listening. I'm sorry that uh, I was starting off and on. And uh, but I hope you got something out of it. Now uh, it is uh, time for uh, discussion. If you have any clarification, doubts regarding the impact theory and also the volcanism theory. Which has a bearing on the extreme cross extinction of the dinosaurs. Please go ahead. If you have any questions, please ask. It. Either you believe it or uh, uh, you don't believe yes. it. Or. Thanks for your uh, detailed uh, dinosaur extinction. Uh, whether it is uh, based on the volcanic uh, activity or the impact activity. So we have the craters in India also where uh, one such crater, Lunar Lake, uh, was created by the impact. So how do you relate the impacts of the meteorites to that of the volcano volcanism both are of different ages or at the same time these volcanisms has been happened because of the impact or uh, after the impact or before the impact not the same time not the same time no uh, it's now we know now the age is including the argument of the age thing. Only they say that it is and it is done. So there really is no problem about that. The age state itself has always been the impactors have always claimed it was the age, the impact age. But it is not the impact age. Until very even now, for the Argon Argon age people, that I showed you one of the figures, they still consider they consider it now that the age date for Argon Argon predates 200,000 years by what Sukon dates are showing is actually the actual age. And the actual age is actually <clears throat> the, uh, well, it's not the jigsaw of impact, but it's actually like an organism. That's the actual age. But we always had it as, as a decan organism in the past. But the jigsaw of impact itself they have now redated as earlier. And so they now say that that is talking about the Argon Argon people. They now say that it, it is still KTH. It's just much different from the age that Sukkot people have dated. 
But Sukhan Tirtha, when you date with Sukhans, your, your error margin is at most 20,000 years. When you date with Argan Argan people, it's at least 200,000 years, plus or minus. So it's pretty difficult to put them together. But I know now also with the Mercury data, we know from paleo data, we know from uh, climate data, we know from virtually every evidence that what we had, and I've known this now since 2000, that when my students had found the essentially the uh, impact spherules that were absolutely pristine in a two meters thick sequence. <clears throat> in that part, the impactors could never believe, so they always denied it. Now they're saying simply that it is the impact itself, but that it, no, that it predates it now. So I think that there will be a lot of discussion uh, about these. There will be still a lot of uh, up, back and forth. But right now, all I can say is that we have so much more data now. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Yes, yes. Is it clear? Hello. I have one uh, general question. Is uh, mass extinction is attributed because of uh, volcanism, impact, climate change, ocean acidification? Which one is the real uh, favorable cause? Acceptable cause for this. In fact, no longer plays any role. Oh. Because the impact predates the S extension by 1300,000. But uh, is it uh, sensible to think that the impact, uh, after immediate impact, there was uh, eruption of uh, lava, something like that? Why? The mercury data is, is very critical uh, because this is where we can actually also date when the impact happened and how it happened. And in this case, we're, these were the mercury data that I analyzed in 2022-21. And this is the one that was analyzed the year after because I waited until we had all this published in order to prevent any of the other problems. Yes. <laughs> so then we then yeah. 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 so when you look at the mercury matter, it's much higher as it is. On the mercury itself, then you can have for argon data, especially on the argon data, but also uh, more specifically in the uranium data. And that is really 
And uh, first of all, I, I express my thanks to our chairman, sir, and all the eminent professors are of our department for organizing this lecture. And I also express my gratitude for uh, you, madam, for coming and sharing your knowledge from all the way long. My question is, uh, you are saying that uh, the dinosaur extinction involves uh, the major part in the mass uh, that is the volcanism. But the thing is, uh, volcanism induces a lot of uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, so in that case, if we consider the impact, uh, it in, uh, it creates the high pressure which lowers the temperature. And there are many uh, instances where the uh, climatic changes uh, to the uh, that is the glaciation or to the uh, low temperatures have uh, involved in the extinction. 
So this is one thing that I need to get clarified. The second thing is you spoke about the usage of zircon in determining the age. So in that I have a doubt because zircon we use for different sorts of dating. Like uh, we, we will get in all the types of rocks. Probably yeah, it may be seen uh, in the lava flows also. But how can you uh, precisely determine the age? For example, in India, uh, the lava flow is uh, predated by the Archean crust. So why can't uh, it may lead to the possibility of the uh, wrong age determination? Yes. I'm not really an organizer, an expert. I work with them. <coughs> However, the real, the real reason here is, um, I think the question we are asking has its own. Absolutely. But what, when you look at the organizer, organizer, that's something completely different from silicon dating. Arganarvi dating does not, it's best, right, it's more or less 400,000, 200,000 years plus or minus. That's what it really is. So if you need an Arganarvi dating, plus or minus 200,000 years. Which is the figure that I have shown earlier on that uh, one of my colleagues, the Sitcom group, uh, has shown. So that is very generous at this point. Um, I don't consider that Argon Argon dating is very useful for high resolution in any way. Sitcom dating. We can have, I think you are asking that some of the circum days may not be run. But what you need to do is you have to sort out what the right ones are. Because you can get uh, circum dates that are changed to the magma chamber. And that means that you cannot use them. So every time all the people that are working on certain dates are very careful and always measuring the pH first and see is it actually staying in the magma chamber, which gives you the numbers, or which ones have been come out early on and that was the age. So that is, I think, if you read those papers, you will know very quickly. Well, CO2 can change, yes. But I don't think that is changing with the silicon days. And uh, it's not, uh, it certainly has nothing to do with that. Uh, CO2 will always change if it changes with age. But in favors or the appetite of the Sure. Yeah, how can it lead to the extinction? And they can press is not. Are you talking about the extinction of the dinosaurs? Yeah, the mass extinction. Yeah, but, but uh, the end times variables have no relationship anymore to the mass extinction itself. That's no longer part of it. And uh, that can also be some. Uh, in India, they died earlier and the rest of the world, a little earlier, not, not that much, but still. Um, I don't know how else I can answer you on this one. Uh, one more question, else, because I think this going through your, uh, one of your work itself, that mm -hmm. is you have published a paper 
called uh, as uh, shower of shower of comments to the masses. Yeah. So if we consider that to this, so what are the advances or how this is contrasting with that particular paper on shower star of comments? Well, there are two things. We are looking at the impact cereals, which has nothing to do with the comment shower. Those are the two different. I worked on that first before I bothered to go for the actual impact uh, because I didn't want to study that uh, when everyone else was. And uh, so the comic shower is something completely That was at uh, the late previous 30 years. So, um, it was simply, it was simply considered the famous paper because they never had found it so that was a good comment on it. So, but this has nothing to do with the impact experience here on the environment, which used to be the community, but now it's 200,000 years. Thank you. No more questions are there. We will uh, uh, end up this uh, question answer session. And if you have any clarification and doubt, I think uh, Madam is always available on mail. You can just send mail and get clarification. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we should all feel uh, uh, ashamed of ourselves, to tell you frankly, because you know the age of Madam, how much she is? She is 80 plus. 80 plus, huh? no, she is traveling all over the world doing field work. She has done. She has done very good field work around the Rampur area, and now she has come to Mysore. Today she will be leaving to Rampi. Like that, she has a continuous program. Despite uh, some uh, hitches in the health of uh, Professor, she has come uh, all over here to deliver this uh, talk. And uh, uh, and she has enlightened us uh, with her thought provoking ideas, especially on the controversies that surround the mass extinction. So, uh, you know that Earth is believed to have been formed some 4,600 million years ago. Till then, it has been subjected to both exogenic process and endogenic process. As a result, various evidences have been erased. Okay, only well, few might have been with her. So, Rostra has such, such uh, few evidences that are available in nature, and she has she is trying to reconstruct the history of the earth, and she is throwing light on the small extinction of the dinosaur. So, we, we all uh, owe a lot to this uh, for your talk, madam. So, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Right, right, right. Now, 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 Excuse me, madam. Please be here. Now it is uh, time for to facilitate uh, Professor Rita Keller, who has come all the way from the United States of America to deliver this lecture. So I request uh, our uh, department, Professor Asha Mujri, madam. Professor Suresh Kumar, Professor Mahesh, so please come out today and let us uh, take a uh, better.
Now we have come to the last part of the program that is put up and by my colleague Professor Kiri Prince. Last but not least, very good afternoon for all of you. I take a very little time to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of you people. We have got the advantages of uh, uh, knowledge related to dinosaurs extinct, whether it is attributed by the volcanoes or the impact, uh, meteoric impacts. First of all, I would like to thank our chairperson who is uh, instrumental to bring uh, Greta, Greta Keller uh, to this department and to have arranged this uh, uh, lecture. I propose one of thanks for Professor Gerta Keller on behalf of all of you and on behalf of University of Mysore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. E.C. Jayaprakash, retired ONGC chief geologist, who is always accompanying with the Greta Keller. I also thank uh, Jayaprakash sir for accompanying her to our department. Thank you very much, sir. I also thank Dr. Nian Reddy, retired ONGC chief geologist, uh, accompanying the Greta Keller with this department on behalf of you and the University of Mysore. I thank you very much, sir. Professor R. Nagendra, the retired professor of Anna University, Chennai, and as many of our department. He is the one person who is always actively involved in our department activities, and he used to give so many lectures in his staff, and he is alumni of our department also. So I thank Dr. Nagendra for uh, being with us and arranging the data uh, colors speech. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, I thank uh, Dr. Baswaraju, retired geologist, ONGC and uh, alumni of our uh, uh, department. So thank you very much for being here with us, sir. 
And I also thank uh, Shrivas Murthy for being with us uh, with all the enthusiasm. Uh, uh, he is with us to uh, yeah, grace this occasion. So thank you very much. So I also thank Professor K. K. Sharma, today Professor Madras University. So he's also with us, he's the alumni of our department. Uh, I thank all, the, all of you and the University of Mysore. Thank you very much, sir. I thank all the meeting staff members, guest faculties, business scholars, non meeting staff members, and those but not least who have done uh, this event live, that is ICD, Manjunath and his team for the scheme uh, lighting arrangement. The entire ICD team has done the live. It is available, uh, the great uh, Greta Keller speech is available in the UOM live. Thanks for the ICD uh, team members. Thank you very much. I also thank all the persons who were involved in this uh, event. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you.